Good everyone. Uh, I welcome you to the uh, first CCR from Endocrinology Department. So basically, we see a lot of pushing patients uh, around 200 in the last uh, one decade. But these two classical patients we have recently seen, so they are very interesting. Uh, means usually it means there is a classical teaching of means falling in one spectrum and the other spectrum, and this 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 cases says where the well, the patient changes actual the borders across the borders and falls in the uh, entirely different sort of spectrum. So uh, this interesting case will be presented by the senior resident from uh, of our department, Dr. Ravindra Nath Reddy, who will take through uh, the first case and briefly uh, some slides uh, through the second case also. So may I invite uh, Dr. Ravindra Nath uh, to present this case? <laughs> Respected faculty and dear colleagues, very good afternoon to all of you. Today I am here to present a case of deceptive endocrine tumor and the reason why we named it so, I will brief it in the last. Coming to the case details, she is a 27 year old married female hailing from Jalaun district Uttar Pradesh who was homemaker presented with chief complaints of paroxysms of headache and palpitations for last 4 years and when evaluated for the same, she was diagnosed to have uncontrolled hypertension and she has been advised antihypertensives but she did not use so and she was also complaining of excess facial and generalized body hair growth for last 3 years with complaints of secondary amenorrhea since 6 months and proximal muscle weakness since 3 months. She was living with these complaints till May 2022. In May 2022 she developed acute onset progressive weakness of all 4 limbs flaccid paralysis without any cranial or sensory involvement and without any bubble and bladder involvement and her serum potassium at that time was 2.6. She was treated with intravenous and oral potassium and her weakness has improved partially with potassium supplementation. She also noticed that since May 2022, she, her severity of headache and palpitations, they have increased both in intensity and frequency, each lasting for about 5 to 10 minutes. On general physical examination, her blood pressure, supine position blood pressure was 156 by 98 millimeter of mercury with significant postural fall to standing of 124 by 84 millimeter of mercury with heart rate of 98 and her BMI was in the range of 19.616 kg per meter square. She was also having features of Cushing's like large dehiscent pink stria of more than 1 cm broad over the abdomen which proximal, with proximal muscle weakness with power of 4 minus by 5 at the level of hips with rounding of faces, chemosis and also hirsutism with modified FG score of 6 by 32. However, there were no signs of severe viralization like hoarseness of voice, clitoromegaly or temporal balding. So th this is the pre-op image of the patient where she was having significant rounding of faces along with hirsutism. So she presented with these complaints in, to us in August 2022 and on pre-op evaluation, this was the investigations of May 2022 where her potassium was in the range of 2.6 and at presentation her potassium was 5.6. She was on replacement with IV and oral potassium on oral pot cloth syrup and she was also having neutrophilic leukocytosis at the same time. As she was having significant progressive signs and symptoms which were suggestive of Cushing syndrome, we have evaluated in terms of Cushing's 8 times serum cortisol was 20.3 excluding exogenous steroid intake, we have proceeded with ONDST, overnight DEXA suppression test where we have given 1 mg of dexamethasone at 11 pm in the night and morning serum cortisol was measured out to be 28.82 microgram per deciliter, it was not suppressed and 11 pm serum cortisol was done which was also more than above the upper limit of normal that is 1.28. We have repeated it twice, however one of the sample got clotted. So this investigations have confirmed endogenous hypercortisolism. So we have proceeded with our next step of plasma ATM ACTH which was also elevated that is 58.24 normal. We have also uh, investigated in uh, because of hirsutism with DHEAs and testosterone. Testosterone level was normal 0 0.198 nanogram per ml and DHEAs was elevated to more than 2 times upper limit of normal. And we have also done in view of hypokalemic hypertension. We have investigated in terms of hyperaldosteronism. The direct renin was 10.94 and aldosterone was 3.17. That is, it is low aldosterone, low renin scenario, and there is a substance 
similar to aldosterone which is causing this picture that is none other than cortisol as she was having paroxysms of headache and palpitations we have evaluated in terms of pheochromocytoma we have proceeded with 24 hour urinary meta and normetanephrines and to our surprise these values came out to be normal and the assay used for high performance liquid chromatography in view of secondary amenorrhea we proceeded with lh fsh and estradiol which was suggest of hypogonadotropic hypogonadism which was secondary to endogenous hypercortisolism intact pth was done to rule out any men1 syndrome and it came out to be normal and free t4 and tsh were also normal so as this patient she was having clinical features of cushing's along with biochemical confirmation of cushing's and acth was normal 58.24 picogram per ml to localize the source of cushing's we have done contrast enhanced mri cella and which came out to be normal now i invite dr sanchita sr radio diagnosis to brief about radiological findings so here we have uh, we have the ct images for this patient what we can see uh, what we can see here is that there is a well defined lesion seen on the left uh, supra renal uh, region which shows loss of planes with the body and the medial uh, limb of the left adrenal uh, along with this uh, in such a case what we would think of would be a uh, primary cushing syndrome that is this tumor itself is secreting cortisol but along with this what we can see is that the opposite uh, opposite adrenal gland also appears bulky which uh, brings us to the possibility of it uh, being acth dependent uh, acth uh, dependent cushing syndrome and because of the normal c mri of the cella the possibility of an uh, cushing syndrome secondary to ectopic acth uh, secretion was considered so with this radiological possibilities of adenocortical carcinoma and pheochromocytoma and the possibility of uh, acth dependent cushing syndrome and pheochromocytoma in the background we have proceeded with functional imaging i invite dr sambit to brief regarding the nuclear imaging this is the iodine 131 meta benzyl guanidine scan uh, this is the anterior planar scan and this is the posterior planar scan on the anterior images we can see a focal infrared radio tracer optic in the uh, left supra renal region on transaxial uh, spec ct images we can uh, confirm that Uh, there is a focal interest uh, uh, interest tracer activity in the left uh, adrenal on the left adrenal uh, after that the patient underwent a, uh, based on this thing uh, mibg scan was consistent uh, with a uh, scan finding of pheochromocytoma after that the patient underwent 18 fdg pet scan on the uh, transaxial images we can see a well defined uh, soft tissue mass lesion in the left adrenal uh, which was unlikely to be a adrenocortical carcinoma as uh, because there was uh, fdg uptake was uh, only slightly higher than that of the liver and uh, there were uh, no areas of uh, necrosis on the pet ct scan also there was no definitive evidence of any metabolically active disease elsewhere in the body with this background so she was having clinical features of pheochromocytoma along with cushing syndrome however biochemically she was negative for pheochromocytoma and biochemically positive for cushing syndrome and radiological features were favorable in consistent with pheochromocytoma and also mibg scan came out to be positive Uh, and fdg pet was also suggestive of more likely diagnosis of pheochromocytoma rather than adenocortical carcinoma with this background sorry with this background and mibg avit left adrenal mass along with acth dependent cushing syndrome when we have when literature review was done there was there were case reports regarding pheochromocytoma which will be secreting acth so the, with the possibility of ectopic acth syndrome secondary to pheochromocytoma we proceeded for surgery in terms of pheochromocytoma we have preoperatively done alpha blocked and beta blocked now i invite dr suneha sr surgery to brief regarding surgical details 
so uh, since the tumor was less than 6 cm in size and there was no suspicion of carcinoma we proceeded with a laparoscopic approach and we did a trans uh, laparoscopic transperitoneal lateral uh, adrenalectomy so this is a short clip showing the uh, steps of the adrenalectomy standard uh, adrenalectomy procedure was performed Okay. So, uh, intraoperatively, intraoperatively, we found a 5 into 4 centimeter tumor arising from the left adrenal gland. During the handling of the tumor tissue, there were some fluctuations in the blood pressure, but no adverse events were noted and the blood pressure was uh, monitored by the anesthetist team. After the uh, adrenal vein was ligated and uh, divided, the blood pressure and the heart rate stabilized. Post-operative period was uneventful uh, as long as the patient was in the hospital. She was, op she was operated in September 2022 and the specimen has been sent for histopathology examination. Now I invite Dr. Surabhi from Department of Pathology to brief regarding histology findings. Uh, so we had received the specimen of left adrenal and on the gross uh, it showed a well circumscribed firm yellow brown tumor which measured 5.5 cm in size and no necrosis or, uh, was seen grossly. So, uh, in the histopathological examination, in the low power we can see that uh, there is a tumour which was composed of uh, tumour cells arranged in zellwollen pattern, that is small nests. And on higher power we will see the character of these cells. Also, we could see that the adjoining adrenal parenchyma showed expansion with prominence of the uh, zona reticularis and zona fasciculata. The higher part of the tumor showed uh, stippled chromatin and uh, there was no significant pleomorphism. The mitotic activity was also uh, not significant and there were no areas of necrosis. However, we found one focus of vascular invasion and we gave a pass score of 1. And uh, we also performed immunohistochemistry for ACTH because the patient had features. However, uh, the immunohistochemistry uh, was for ACTH was negative. And that is what we had reported. The tumor cells were positive for chromogranin and ISM1, and we gave a final diagnosis of pheochromocytes. Post surgery, we, our diagnosis was finalized to be a pheochromocytoma with the hyperplastic cortex. So, this cortex is secreting the cortisol. So, post operatively, clinically, her blood pressure has been well controlled with only two antihypertensives to 124 by 78 and serum potassium also normalized and plasma ACTH and serum cortisol both were suppressed post-operatively to less than 1 and to less than 0 0.299 uh, microgram per deciliter. This confirms the diagnosis that this left adrenal mass is the source of ACTH. So, the, our final diagnosis was pheochromocytoma with ectopic ACTH syndrome. When com uh, coming to the diagnostic criteria for the diagnosis, initially 1976, four men at all, they have uh, proposed a diagnostic criteria in a patient with pheochromocytoma with ectopic ACC, ACTH syndrome. In 1995, Chain et al, they have modified this criteria with any three pause, any three of the five criteria are positive, the patient will be confirmed to be a diagnosed to, to be pheo with ectopic ACTH. This patient was having clinical and laboratory evidence, biochemical evidence of hypercortisolism with elevated plasma ACTH. However, biochemically, she was negative for pheochromocytoma. However, after unilateral adrenalectomy, there were complete resolution of signs and symptoms of both cortical and catecholamine excess, and there was also normalization of plasma ACTH post-surgery. And post-surgery, we have started her on physiological glucocorticoid replacement, and till date, she is under our follow-up. Post-surgery, her blood pressure is still well controlled and four months post surgery also she is under well follow up. This is a response, there is decrease in the hirsutism and also decrease in rounding of faces post operatively. And to confirm the diagnosis, we have also proceeded with gallium dotanox scan post operatively. There was no evidence of any residual lesion. So, this is the site of post operative clip. So, there is no evidence of any residual lesion and also there is no other lesion in the body to confirm it as an ectopic source. 
to find any occult source coming to discussion part when we see a patient of cushing syndrome who are having signs and symptoms the first foremost thing will be excluding the source of any exogenous steroid intake by do doing a time serum cortisol followed by screening test with either 24 hour urinary free cortisol late night salivary cortisol at least two values and dexa suppression test if any of the screening tests are positive and we will be confirming endogenous hypercortisolism and we will be proceeding with 8 am acth levels plasma acth level if plasma acth levels are more than 15 picogram per ml it could be a acth dependent cushings if levels are less than 5 picogram per ml it could be acth independent cushings so in an acth independent cushings the source of cortisol will be from the adrenal gland and we will be evaluating in terms of adrenal imaging so this patient she was having levels of more than 15 picogram per ml but there can be two possibilities either the source can be pituitary which is the most common source or there is an ectopic source this ectopic source in this case in our case was the left adrenal gland sorry coming to ectopic acth syndrome which is a rare condition which accounts for only 15 to 20 percent of acth dependent cushing syndrome though although previously small cell lung carcinoma was the most common cause of ectopic acth syndrome now due to increased imaging modalities the bronchial carcinoid has become the most common cause followed by thymic carcinoid and there have been case reports regarding pancreatic nets non small cell lung carcinoma medullary thyroid carcinoma pheochromocytoma and rare carcinomas of ovary prostate breast gallbladder and colon and also lymphomas and melanomas all these cancers are associated with ectopic acth production and also they can lead to cushings coming to various etiology studies performed on various etiologies of uh, ectopic acth syndrome the largest study including 90 patients of ectopic acth syndrome done in by elias et al in 2005 the most common etiology was bronchial carcinoid and there were only five cases of pheochromocytoma reported in this case in this study in the next study by isidori et al published from uk 40 cases of ectopic acth syndrome were included and there was only one case of pheochromocytoma and from study from brazil where 25 cases of ectopic acth syndrome has been studied there were five cases of pheochromocytoma in which one patient was having bilateral pheochromocytoma and that case was mentu syndrome coming to the studies from india in the study published from aims uh, from our department by dr amini mam et al in 2012 22 patients of ectopic acth health syndrome were studied bronchial carcinoma was the most common etiology however there were no cases of pheochromocytoma in the next study by dr bhavana et al in published in 2022 recently where 23 cases of ectopic acth health syndrome has been studied there was one patient of pheochromocytoma this patient of pheochromocytoma she was operated in 2015 she presented with features of severe cushing syndrome and we have got her immediately operated with bilateral adrenalectomy as we were unable to localize the source we immediately operated with bilateral adrenalectomy and she's still under our follow-up and she's doing well Next coming to the ectopic ACTH producing pheochromocytomas, why is this such a rare condition? It is difficult to suspect and coexistence of glucocorticoid excess, it will alter the clinical presentation. And coexistence of pheochromocytoma with Cushing's, it is also associated with significant complications like increased uh, DVT and till date worldwide only 99 cases have been reported. So when with these patients, uh, of uh, in a meta-analysis published by Patrick et al in JCM 2021 they have showed that the majority of patients of pheochromocytoma they were having Cushing, so Cushingoid phenotype and they were also having moderate to severe hypercortisolism there was severe uncontrolled hypertension and hypokalemia there were also increased psychiatric manifestations and increased risk of thrombosis in these patients of pheochromocytoma with ectopic ACTH syndrome however to our surprise, this patient, she was having immunohistochemistry negative for ACTH. Is ACTH immunohistochemistry mandatory for all cases of uh, ectopic ACTH? The answer is no. Immuno, sorry. In this systematic review and meta-analysis published by Elliot et al. in JCM, they have shown that immunohistochemistry was positive 
isolated ACTH expression was there in 78 tumors, CRH expression was seen in 4 tumors and dual ACTH and CRH staining was seen in 2 tumors. 15 tumors there was no documented evidence of ACTH or CRH staining and of these 15 tumors, 14 tumors were having ACTH hypersecretion and postoperatively they documented that ACTH has been suppressed to uh, below normal level. In our case, CRH secretion could have been a possibility, but to suspect CRH secreting pheochromocytoma, this patient postoperatively, she the cortisol levels has been severely suppressed. If CRH was the source of, uh, if adrenal was the source of CRH, there would have been pituitary hyperplasia. We will expect pituitary hyperplasia in that patient and these levels should ha not have been drastically suppressed postoperatively. And also postoperative glucocorticoid replacement should not be such prolonged. So she is till date 8 months postoperative and she is still requiring glucocorticoid replacement. And when you have reviewed the cases of CRH producing pheochromocytomas, it has been shown that these patients will also be requiring post-op glucocorticoid re replacement, but the maximum period was only up to 7 weeks. Post 7 weeks, they, they will not be requiring uh, glucocorticoid replacement. But this patient, even after 8 months of post-operative period, she is still requiring uh, glucocorticoid replacement. And her HP axis has not been recovered till date. Coming to the studies which have shown that ACTH stain can be negative in patients with ectopic ACTH syndrome. In the study by Isidori et al, they have shown that in within the 40 cases of ectopic ACTH syndrome, near to 30% of cases were having ACTH negative on immunohistochemistry. And also by the study by Sal, Salgado et al in Brazil, 20, within 25 patients of ectopic ACTH syndrome, 8 patients were having ACTH stain negative. And study by Camp et al published in European Journal of Endocrinology in 29 cases, 18% of cases were having ACTH stain negative. This states that the ACTH stain on immunohistochemistry is not mandatory to say the diagnosis of ACTH hypersecretion from the tumor. So what are the reasons for negative ACTH staining? One can be a de-differentiation of tumor and tumors with very rapid high turnover can be negative for ACTH. and some studies have shown that there is increased production of ACTH precursors rather than ACTH directly. There is increased production of POMC and other uh, precursors which will lead to uh, negative result on IHC. Poor fixation could be a possibility or there can be an another occult source with modest secretion. To rule out this occult source, we, we have done a gallium dot not post operatively in this patient and which came out to be negative. And the literature shows that 30% of ectopic ACTH secreting tumors can be negative on immunohistochemistry and we need not require a immunohistochemistry positivity to claim that uh, this case patient, this uh, tumor is uh, ACTH is coming from this tumor. Coming to a second case, just I will be briefing out a similar case which we came across in last two months. She is a 43 year old female. Clinically, she has presented with the features of Cushing syndrome. For last six months she was symptomatic and biochemically she was also as ACDH dependent Cushing syndrome. She was also having MRI cell are normal and in this case we have next step we have proceeded with bilateral inferior petrosal sinus sampling which localized the ACTH source to be periphery. So there is no pituitary source of ACTH and no pituitary source of Cushing's. There is only a peripheral lesion which is causing this uh, Cushing guard features. Next, we proceeded with gallium dot knock scan and CCT abdomen at a time. We have found an somatostatin receptor expressing lesion localized to right adrenal gland. And CCT may there was 5.6 into 4.8 centimeter hypodense mass which was arising from right adrenal gland with features consistent of again pheochromocytoma by adenocortical carcinoma. With the background history, uh, background uh, experience from this case, previous case, we have also sufficiently alpha blocked and beta blocked this patient and we have proceeded with laparoscopic adrenalectomy. Postoperatively, serum cortisol was suppressed to 2.1 microgram per deciliter and ACTH was also suppressed. And she was also started on physiological repla replacement with steroids and histopathology in this patient turned out to be pheochromocytoma 
and this patient had immunohistochemistry positive for ACTH. More than 50% of tumor cells in the histopathology were positive for ACTH in this case. So to conclude, ACTH secreting pheochromocytomas being a rare entity and as most of these patients they present with the features of Cushing syndrome. And Cushing patients, when we suspect, they will be having a neuropsychiatric manifestations and they can be clinically silent for pheochromocytoma. For example, second patient, she was clinically silent for pheochromocytoma and biochemically we have also confirmed with urinary meta and nor metanephrines, they also turned out to be negative. So, in, in such cases, we require preoperative management with sufficient alpha and beta blockade. When there is no source of uh, ACTH and there is a on radiology when there is a patient having adrenal tumor which is a suspicion of pheochromocytoma and ACTH dependent Cushing syndrome then we have to think of a case of pheochromocytoma with ectopic ACTH secretion and there is necessary that we should sufficiently alpha and beta block at this patient prior to surgery because there could be severe intraop blood pressure fluctuations and severe derangement in the patient outcome. And also functional imaging, it, it is very useful in the localization of ectopic ACTH source where doing gallium dot knock and MIBG prior to this case, prior to surgeries could help us to localize the source and also it will help to localize the diagnosis. And ectopic ACTH source need not always be positive for immunohistochemistry. Uh, so we on behalf of Department of Endocrinology, I want to thank Department of General Surgery, Radio Diagnosis and Nuclear Medicine and Pathology for helping out to uh, treat these patients and for the best outcomes for these patients. And the reason why we named it as deceptive is the reason why because first patient fa false impression on seeing the patient she was having absolutely clinical, phenoty clinical phenotype of Cushing syndrome and this patient was also having ACTH positive biochemically and this patient was also having an adrenal mass. So whenever a patient is having adrenal mass, we will directly think of ACTH independent Cushing syndrome. So th it should not be a case. So whenever there is a tumor, adrenal tumor and patient is also having uh, high ACTH, we should think of possibility of this adrenal mass can be a pheochromocytoma or it could be also adrenocortical carcinoma. There has been one case report of adrenocortical carcinoma which is which patient presented with features of Cushing syndrome. It has been reported from Sri Lanka in 2020. So that is the case of adrenocortical carcinoma. So we have to suspect either ACC or pheochromocytoma to be a source of ectopic ACTH syndrome and we have to treat in those lines. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Dr. Vitravindra. So, any comments on this? Uh... So, basically, there are two or three messages. One from an interesting perspective, uh, only 1% of the Cushing syndrome is attributed to pheochromocytoma. And 1% of the pheochromocytoma can present as a topic ACTH. This is from an interesting perspective. From clinical perspective, from medical uh, specialties, so the first case which presented to us is basically after three or four years lag. Whereas in the literature, the lag is usually around six months. So still in Indian settings, the lag is too much high. That is one of the reasons that the patient is requiring corticosteroid supplementation even after eight months when the median reported supplementation period is around six weeks. So I think we are missing from a clinical uh, perspective uh, and there is a considerable lag in diagnosis in the Indian setting. From the surgical uh, perspective, means uh, uh, thing is that most of the tumors may not behave as a pheochromocytoma because like first tumor and the second first tumor was clinically uh, uh, I mean suspicious for pheo but second tumor was completely clinical silent for pheo but on histopathology it, it was uh, revealing pheochromocytoma so in case where there is an adrenal tumor and we are not able to work up biochemically for metanephrines nor metanephrines so what the protocol is to prepare the patient as a pheo uh, means and before subjecting to the surgery. I think this is a key message from a surgical perspective because given the cost of 6,000, 7,000, not all patients may afford that metanephrine or metanephrine. 
So it is better to put a low dose alpha blocker hydrate and prepare like you before subjecting to the surgery. I think these are two or three clinical messages from our side. And my sincere thanks to Dr. Chumbar uh, for applying this case to present it from endocrine. Thank you so much. Thank you, Uhu. Thank you. And happy Holi for everyone in advance. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, from Surgery Unit 4, we are going to present uh, two cases of uh, pediatric renal transplant. The transplant as a, as a specialty in this institute has been going on for the last 50 years, more than 15 years. But uh, pediatric transplant constitutes maybe less than 10% of the total transplants done uh, in this institute so far. And uh, the pediatric transplant <coughs> imposes certain unique challenges for the managing team which includes uh, pediatric nephrologists, pediatric surgeons, us as transplant surgeons, the anesthetist and uh, the nursing, nursing staff in the ward. So we just decided to present these two unique challenging cases to just bring home the message that uh, pediatric transplant is a feasible option and you can get excellent outcomes but with good teamwork. So I will request Dr. Sai to present the clinical profile, Dr. Deepthi will discuss it. And then we have uh, Dr. Srinivas from Pediatric Nephrology and uh, Dr. Poor from Pediatric Surgery and uh, Dr. Jokeshwar from Anesthesia side to tell us about these difficulties and the unique challenges these patients have. Dr. Sai, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Coming to the first case, uh, it's a 10 year old boy. He was antenatally detected to have uh, oligohydramnos. On postnatal scan, he was detected to have fused uh, ectopic pelvic kidney with pelvic uretic junction obstruction. He had complaints of recurrent urinary tract infection in uh, neonatal and infancy, for which he underwent bilateral open Anderson Hines pi uh, uh, pyloplast. In spite of the surgery, he had uh, recurrent uh, episodes of urinary tract infection in uh, childhood and uh, he had worsening uh, uh, renal function. So he was started on uh, hemodialysis at age of 4 years. Initially, uh, he was started uh, dialysis through uh, a double lumen jugular catheter. Later, he was uh, switched over to peritoneal dialysis. At the same time, he underwent uh, subtotal parathyroidectomy for uh, hyperparathyroidism. Uh, six months into the peritoneal dialysis, he developed uh, catheter-induced peritonitis for which CAPD catheter was removed. At five years of age, he was uh, evaluated for diseased uh, donor renal transplant in an outside private hospital. And he underwent uh, renal transplant at age of five years. He developed graft uh, bean thrombosis at, uh, on post-op day four, and he underwent graft nephrectomy on post-op day 15. Following this, he was investigated for uh, cause of uh, graft thrombosis, and it was found that there were multiple uh, sites of venous thrombosis in the bilateral external iliac vein and the right common iliac uh, vein, and the bilateral internal jugular vein and right subclavian veins had thrombosis. A uh, blood workup for this uh, showed that he was a heterozygous carrier for proteinase deficiency and uh, he was a carrier for uh, factor V lead and mutation. Uh, he uh, then uh, and subsequently underwent uh, focused uh, left inferior pa parathyroidectomy for uh, persistent hy hyperparathyroidism and the gastrostomy uh, tube was placed for nutrition. He had uh, CAPD catheter uh, related uh, 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 fungal sepsis for which CAPD catheter was uh, removed. Uh, following this, he was on maintenance hemodialysis. He was he presented to us for uh, renal transplantation. He was evaluated. Uh, uh, only uh, uh, mother was the only donor available. Although she was ABO incompatible, it was decided to proceed ahead with the transplant because uh, none of the other family members were uh, uh, were uh, fit for surgery, and uh, his father had diabetic uh, uh, nephropathy. On clinical examination, uh, weight of the child was 22 kg with a BMI of 16.2. On uh, per abdomen examination, he had a scar of uh, previous nephrectomy and uh, uh, previous CAPD insertion. And the scar was on the right uh, flank and gastrostomy tube was on, on the left hypochondrium region. Uh, this patient had multiple medical and uh, surgical challenges. I invite Dr. Uh, Srinivas from pediatric uh, nephrology to discuss the medical science. As we could see that uh, from the uh, 
previous two slides uh, the longer duration of his illness uh, has uh, caused a lot of uh, morbidities for this child uh, first would be the short stature even after correcting his uh, nutritional uh, status uh, we even tried placing gastrostomy however his uh, short stature was always a concern for this child and uh, uh, the use of multiple uh, uh, deep veins for uh, access for the hemodialysis resulted in access thrombosis which was a hindrance in uh, even placing a catheter during the intra-op period for uh, post-op uh, medications and uh, uh, the post parathyroidectomy status uh, uh, resulted in uh, requirement of higher doses of calcium and activated vitamin D uh, to maintain his uh, calcium levels. So once we were uh, considered for uh, the uh, transplant, uh, uh, the major concerns were uh, he was uh, highly sensitized because he has already received a cadaveric tran uh, transplant in 2017 and also uh, during the uh, intermittent illnesses uh, he has received multiple blood transfusions so uh, he was highly sensitized I would uh, uh, just show in the next slide uh, a donor search was done uh, for the compatible uh, blood group compatible donors uh, the uh, father was uh, uh, having a blood group compatibility however he was uh, having uh, some concerns with uh, uh, tubulopathy so he was uh, uh, rejected from the uh, nephrology side uh, grandfather and grandmother were also evaluated however given the concern of the age and the pre-diabetic status uh, the grandparents were also not eligible so uh, we even tried for a paired uh, kidney donor transplant uh, preparation however uh, the after detailed counseling with the mother we uh, finally uh, decided that mother would be the uh, donor uh, although in the status of an ABO incompatibility uh, as per the previous evaluation, uh, due to the factor V laden mutation and the heterozygous state for uh, 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 heterozygous state, uh, he was already on anoxaparin for anticoagulation, which was a major concern during the uh, intra period because uh, he had to be continued on uh, an uh, um, antithrombotic agent, otherwise, uh, uh, there will be risk of uh, renal uh, graft thrombosis. Uh, the major un uh, another concern was uh, the COVID pandemic uh, because uh, uh, here we could see that we have uh, performed uh, the uh, 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 plasma exchanges and uh, uh, the other uh, desensitization protocols. Uh, although once we prepare them, there would be a wave of COVID which uh, uh, caused a hindrance in the transplant. We uh, performed uh, uh, we used rituximab, IVIG, and plasma exchanges as a part of uh, pre-transplant desensitization. So, uh, as he was considered as a high risk uh, transplant, uh, the induction was uh, uh, induction drug used was uh, antithymocyte globulin followed by the uh, triple drug immunosuppression with tacrolimus, mycophenolate, uh, and uh, steroids, which was continued uh, as a maintenance immunosuppression also. And he was monitored for anti hepatitis in view of uh, ABO incompatibility. Thank you, sir. Uh, coming to the surgical challenges, the main uh, main challenge in this patient were uh, multiple sites of venous thrombosis. Uh, to, uh, so choosing a appropriate site for the anastomosis was a challenge. Uh, we were not sure of the uh, status of the vessels uh, preoperatively. And uh, yeah, since it was a second transplant, and uh, uh, and uh, there was gastrostomy tube was in uh, close proximity to the surgical field. Uh, they were the dense uh, additions were anticipated and uh, 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 retroperitoneum uh, it was an anticipated to be plastered and on top of this uh, a large adult kidney was being placed in a small site so it, which further complicates the uh, availability of space and children uh, especially have uh, small uh, caliber vessels with uh, thin walls uh, so, uh, so in the, in these cases uh, vascular anastomosis is itself a challenge uh, after considering all these factors, uh, we, uh, we uh, routinely start wo uh, both the donor and recipient surgeries simultaneously. But in this particular case, we are taking up the recip uh, recipient first for surgery to assess for the uh, caliber of the vessels and uh, to assess for the space uh, for transplant. And uh, in this case, we, have, uh, uh, we usually prefer the right side. Uh, of the abdomen for placing the graft kidney uh, because IVC is on the right and it can be better uh, accessed and uh, skeletonized from the right side. And coming to the vascular anastomosis, it was planned that uh, if we place the kidney on the right side, we will uh, anastomose it with the uh, inferior vena cava or portal vein or and iota depending on the feasibility. Uh, 
and if they were found to be not feasible, uh, we will proceed ahead with uh, placing the kidney on the left and anastomos anastomosing it with the native renal vessels or the splenic uh, vessels. Ureter anastomosis was decided uh, that it will be uh, anastomosed to the native bladder or uh, ureter depending on the intraoperative findings. Intraoperatively, uh, uh, retro peritoneal space could not be entered due to dense adhesion, so it was decided uh, uh, that we replace the graft intraperitoneally. After great difficulty, we could uh, skeletonize part of uh, iota, iota and IVC as seen here. These are the dense adhesions which can be seen in the retroperitoneum and these are the retractors which are used for retracting the abdominal wall. After, uh, after skeletonizing the uh, iota and IVC for the adequate length, they were found to be healthy with uh, no, uh, no thrombosis with good flow. And uh, as depicted here, we, have, we had anastomosis the uh, uh, renal artery with the iota and uh, renal vein with the inferior vena cap. And donor ureter was anastomosed to the native bladder over a digest. IVC clamp time was 25 minutes and iota was 12 minutes. Post uh, declamping, uh, uh, he had uh, kidney was pink and tested with uh, good uh, urine. Here we can see the uh, picture post uh, venous anastomosis. This is the iota and this is the do donor renal artery. Here we can see post arterial anastomosis after declamping. This is the uh, donor artery and this is the iota. And here we can see the uh, donor kidney which is pink and tested. Post operative post, patient did well. Uh, uh, his urine output was uh, 150 to 300 ml on uh, post op day one. Uh, he, uh, we usually don't start uh, anticoagulation in our patient routinely, but in this particular case, we have started him on uh, heparin six hours after surgery, considering the multiple uh, throm uh, thrombos venous thrombosis. He was discharged on post op day 13 with a creatinine of uh, 0.28. Currently, he is 10 months follow up and he is doing well. Uh, as you can see here, it's, uh, this is last month's uh, image with a create of 0.5. Coming to the second case, he's a 16 year old boy who had complaints of poor urinary stream in uh, neonatal period. On evaluation, he was found to have posterior urethral wall. He underwent uh, cystoscopic and uh, fulguration of wall at age of uh, one year and uh, vesicostomy, which was close uh, later. He had complaints of recurrent UTI during uh, childhood and uh, he underwent uh, diversion bilateral uh, loop urethrost. At age of 14 years, he underwent augment, uh, augmentation alveo cystoplasty. The indication for this procedure will be uh, dealt later with uh, by Dr. Apu. Uh, at age of 14 years, he was started on um, maintenance hemodialysis. He had complaints of multiple uh, uh, vascular access failure uh, in uh, childhood, uh, two years prior to surgery. He had uh, multiple hospital admissions to two years prior to surgery because of uh, hypertensive emergencies, which are managed conservatively. He presented to us at age of 16 years uh, for uh, assessment for transplant and uh, donor uh, was mother and uh, it was an ABO compatible transplant. On examination, weight of the uh, child was 20, uh, 26 kg with a BMI of 18. On abdomen examination, scar of previous uh, surgery was seen, midline scar and uh, lower transverse scar was seen and metrophanov was present on the right uh, abdomen. The main uh, surgical challenge in this uh, patient was the mitrophanov being on the right side of the abdomen. We usually prefer to uh, transplant uh, the kidney on the right side because of the favor favorable vascular anatomy and uh, the uh, vessels be IVC being on the right side, it is more favorable uh, to uh, transplant. However, in this case, uh, mitrophanov and uh, allele pouch being on the right side, uh, it was not possible to proceed from the right. Uh, so it was decided that we will proceed uh, from the left. And another uh, uh, issue in this patient was the uh, previous surgeries leading on to difficult access and uh, dense adhesions. And uh, as uh, stated previously, the previous uh, augmentation alveocystoplasty made the decision of ureteric anastomosis even more difficult whether to anastomose with the native bladder or the ureter. Uh, so, pediatric surgery help was taken in draw for uh, ureteric reimplantation. I'll uh, now call upon Dr. Rahul from pediatric. So, uh, this child posed us uh, some different concerns, uh, especially which we uh, see in uh, adolescent uh, who are undergoing uh, hemodialysis. Uh, he had uh, poor complaints with water intake, which resulted in uh, 
significant intradilatic weight gain and uh, that was one of the main reason for his persistent severe hypertension requiring high antihypertensives to control his uh, blood pressures. He also had other concerns with augmented bladder as he has already mentioned and uh, there was some concerns in terms of compliance to uh, the cl uh, clean intermittent catheterization uh, in this child. So, uh, as there were no uh, 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 high risk in this child, we consider it a, a standard risk uh, uh, for the immunosuppression and he was uh, given uh, basiliximab as an induction and was continued with uh, maintenance of tacrolimus, mycophenolate and steroids. Now, I would like to call uh, Dr. Apoor to explain the metrophenol. So, the rationale for metrophenol in this uh, patient was to decrease the bladder, cap uh, decrease the bladder pressures and to increase the bladder uh, capacity which could not be attained despite adequate and um, supramaximal uh, and doses of the drugs. So, uh, this was done to prevent upper tract de uh, deterioration especially in the kidney which will be transplanted at a later date. So, the options available are endocystoplasty, gastrocystoplasty, auto augmentation or a uh, uh, cystoplasty. So, in this patient we had gone ahead and, and uh, uh, did a ileocystoplasty. So, the indications in this patient was a uh, uh, pre uh, uh, pre evaluation uh, UDS was done, which had showed that the measured systematic capacity was only 25% of the expected one, with a with a PD 10 and 20 achieved achieved at 50 and 60 ml respectively, with the maximum uh, uh, pressure being uh, 51 centimeters of water, which was unsafe. So we went ahead and and, and did an augmentation in this patient. However, there are few draw draw drawbacks of augmentation, which include repeated imbalances, impaired bone growth mucus production in uh, infections, vitamin B2, 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 B2 de deficiencies and uh, concern of malignancy as well. Uh, the main reason we went ahead and did a, did a metrophenol in this patient was uh, because the augmented patch that we have used does not uh, participate in the bladder contraction. So, there is incomplete uh, emptying of the, the bladder during wording resulting in an increased PVR. So, these uh, patients are usually managed with, uh, with a CIC. But however, since this was a case of PUV with a sensate urethra, we could not do, uh, do that because the compliance was poor. So, we had gone ahead and do a metrophenol as well. Uh, regarding the effects of blood augmentation on renal transplant studies have shown, shown that the, the effects are, 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 are similar. The only difference is that if the compliance of CIC is poor, there is an increased risk of UTI post augmentation otherwise uh, renal augmentation uh, is not affected adversely by blood, by blood augmentation. Thank you, sir. Uh, coming to the operative finding, uh, we have approached uh, this patient from the left side. Uh, on the left side, uh, common iliac artery and vein were skeletal. They were found to be of uh, uh, good caliber uh, with no thrombosis. And uh, renal artery and uh, vein were anastomous with the common iliac artery and uh, vein. Uh, clamped uh, on up time was 22 uh, minutes and the ureter was anastomous to the nat uh, native ureter uh, 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 over a uh, digester. Post-operative course, patient uh, did well, uh, post-op day 1, urine output was 600 to 900 ml per hour and uh, on post-op day 1, he had single uh, episode of uh, generalized uh, seizure, uh, likely metabolic, which was managed conservatively and he was discharged on post-op day 11 with a serum creatinine of 0 0.6. Currently, he is 4 months follow-up and he is doing well. He was admitted once uh, three months uh, during 3 months follow-up with uh, complaints of uncomplicated UTI, which was managed conservatively. Currently, he is voiding self and uh, requiring CIC through metropenop uh, around four times a day. Now, I would like to call up uh, Dr. Uh, Yog Shankar from anesthesia to discuss. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I will be discussing about the anesthetic management of uh, children undergoing pediatric renal transplantation. The major concerns regarding the anesthetic management are uh, Difficulty in getting uh, gaining a uh, vascular access and uh, difficulty in uh, reliable and uh, accurate intravascular volume status assessment and uh, major hemodynamic upheaval during declumping and uh, there is lack of evidence to guide that guide the type of intravenous fluid and the amount of in intravenous fluid which can be administered in children under undergoing renal transplantation. We assess the in the preoperative period, we assess the X-ray tolerance of both the recipients, and uh, both the recipients had a uh, good X-ray tolerance with the uh, metabolic equivalence of more than four. And both the patients were hypertensive, and the first recipient was on a tablet amlodipine, and the, as mentioned before, recipient two was on multiple antihypertensives. 
pre operative echocardiography and uh, ecg were uh, within normal limits and uh, regarding the anesthetic management we induce the patient with the injection fentanyl injection etomidate and injection atracurium following which we secure the airway with the cupped endotracheal tubes and uh, anesthesia was maintained with oxygen nitrous oxide and uh, desflurane in recipient 1 and uh, isoflurane in recipient 2 the intraoperative analgesia was provided with injection fentanyl infusion and uh, intermittent boluses as when required and supplemented with injection pro injection paracetamol and uh, local infiltration with bupivacaine and the uh, reversal of neuromuscular blockade was done with neostigmine and glycoprolate at the end of the surgery other drugs which were administered are uh, magnex hydrocortisone furosemide and ondansetron according to weight the intraoperative hemodynamic goals were to achieve a mean arterial pressure of more than 70 mm of mercury and central venous pressure of more than 12 mm of mercury and to maintain adequate preload and to use vasopressors judicially as when required to maintain mean arterial pressure of more than more than 70 after adequate fluid resuscitation this is the table showing the intraoperative fluid that we gave uh, in recipient one, we gave a total volume of 1,375 ml, which included crystallites, blood products, and colloids. And in recipient two, we gave 900 ml of uh, intravenous fluids. Recipient one required intermittent usage of uh, injection dopamine at titrated doses to maintain mean arterial pressure more than 70, and which was subsequently titrated and stopped at the end of the surgery. Uh, Perioperative events for the first recipient. Uh, post extubation, recipient one developed excessive airway secretions and crepitations at the end of surgery. We diagnosed it as pulmonary edema and it was managed with uh, positive airway pressure, injection lasix, and injection morphine. After 30 minutes, pulmonary edema was resolved and the patient was awake, alert, and hemodynamically stable, and the patient was shifted to KTP ward. Thank you. And I'd like to call Dr. Deepthi for discussion. Thank you, Dr. Yokshaker. That was very insightful. Uh, we'll now come to a discussion about the review of literature. So, coming to how is pediatric renal transplantation different from that in adults? So, first of all, the etiology. The most common cause in children is congenital anomalies of the kidney and urinary tract in approximately 40% of the patients, followed by hereditary or cystic disorders and then glomerular diseases in the adolescents. Now, the outcomes in pediatric transplantation are slightly inferior to that of adults because this population has an increased risk of uh, graft loss as well as the mortality. However, literature does show that uh, if a child is more than 2 years of age and more than 15 kgs in weight, they have been shown to have a good outcome. The challenges in pediatric renal transplant, first of all, it's very important to note that children are not just small adults. There are several challenges as we have shown in both of our patients, ranging from medical challenges such as the need for dialysis, dialysis access, CAPD and associated infections, as well as the availability of donor, immunological challenges such as ABO incompatibility and uh, the child having uh, undergone a previous transplant being highly, highly sensitized, surgical challenges such as vascular challenges where children have small caliber vessels, hence having a higher risk of thrombosis, urological challenges, most of which require correction three to six months prior to the transplant, and most of these children are also nutritionally poor, requiring buildup such as through a gastrostomy tube feeding, like one of our patients had. Anesthetic challenges, as have been already uh, elaborated, altered hemodynamics. And uh, in a child that is more than 30 kgs of weight, the transplant procedure is almost the same as of that in adults. Coming to the preoperative preparation, it is very crucial to have adequate intravascular uh, volume uh, status before the transplant, as this population, like I said, is at an increased risk of graft thrombosis and hypoperfusion which can further lead to acute tubular necrosis. Subclinical infections in them should be evaluated thoroughly and any recent episode of CAPD-associated peritonitis does not preclude the procedure. The child can be given two weeks of antibiotics and then taken for the procedure. From the surgical point of view, how do we modify the technique? So given that the space in a child is small, we can extend the incision right up to the ribcage as shown in this figure here. We can use partial occluding clamps instead of complete occluding clamps. The renal vein is usually an astomose to the inferior vena cava and the artery to the common iliac artery or the iota. 
What is noteworthy here is that a 10 kg child has a circulating blood volume of approximately 1000 to 1500 ml and in this child the perfused adult kidney removes 700 to 800 ml uh, of blood per minute and this is a major cause for concern especially in the immediate post-operative period predisposing the child to the risk of ATN. However, as the time goes on, the body gets accommodated to the altered hemodynamics. And in patients with an augmented bladder that had a congenital bladder abnormality, the ureter is preferably an astomose to the native bladder itself and a submucosal tunnel is created. If an ileum or cecum is used for the augmentation, the donor ureter may be an astomose without a tunnel or to the native ureter. A brief note on the Mitrofenov procedure. So Paul Mitrofenov described this uh, transappendicular continence cystostomy in 1980. Here, as we can see, the appendix is used to create a continent conduit between the bladder and the skin. Now, this is easier for clean intermittent catheterization than the polyurethral uh, route, and that's why it is uh, preferred. The bladder neck is usually closed, and the emptying is carried out via CIC. Our experience in pediatric renal transplantation starting from 2012 till date, we have done the transplantation in 104 patients with a median age of 9 years, body weight of 18.5 kgs, majority of our donors were live and majority of them were mothers followed by fathers. The most common etiology was reflux nephropathy secondary to posterior urethral valve. The mean operative time was approximately 100 minutes and the mean serum creatinine at uh, 3 months post-operative follow-up was around 0.8 mg per deciliter. Majority of the arterial anastomosis was done to the common iliac artery and the venous was to the common iliac vein. 30% of our patients had a uh, urinary tract infection in the post-operative period and acute graft rejection was seen in 18 of them. Five patients had immediate graft loss and all five of them required donor nephrectomy. Sorry, uh, graft nephrectomy. So this is a study from our institute itself. Starting from 1995 till 2017, uh, transplant, pediatric renal transplant was done in 116 patients with a median follow-up of four and a half years. Uh, the survival was excellent. Uh, uh, the graft survival at one year was 92% and at 15 years was 77%. Patient survival at one year was 95% and 79 at 15 years. So this study also showed that pediatric renal transplantation in developing countries has similar outcomes as compared to the developed regions. A similar study that was conducted in Japan on 104 children again showed similar graft survival rates at 92% at one year and uh, reaching 50 to 55% at 10 to 15 years and 30% at 30 years. The most common cause of graft loss in their study was chronic allograft injury. This is another study, a retrospective analysis in more than 7,000 patients which mainly showed that if a child is in the age group of 5 to 18 years they are more likely to have a lower 10-year graft survival and this is due to poor adherence with the immunosuppressive therapy as the child reaches adolescence. This is a study in uh, adult recipients. It mainly shows that the uh, outcomes are almost similar as compared to pediatric renal transplants with a 1-year graft survival of 97%, 5-year survival of 86%. In conclusion, we can say that pediatric transplant is definitely very challenging as we have seen and discussed in both of our patients. There are several challenges, medical, urological, immunological, vascular, donor and surgical. However, renal transplantation in children is safe and effective and has been shown to have excellent outcomes with good teamwork. The team is not just general surgery and pediatric nephrology, but also pediatric surgery, anesthesia, pathology, radiology, nuclear medicine, the blood bank, physiotherapists, dietitians, immunology, our OT staff, and last but not the least, our nursing officers. Thank you. So this is an image showing our, uh, this wonderful card that one of our nine-year-old recipients had made of physiotherapy in our uh, renal transplant unit at the surgical block, our wonderful renal transplant team, and this is our latest four-year-old uh, pediatric recipient that is being discharged today. Thank you. Thank you, Diti. As, as she said, uh, the, it is not only us who are doing this job. Actually, it is mainly the pediatric nephrologist and the anesthetist, which have the main role in actually the pediatric transplant. Our job is same as adult. We just have to do the anesthetist. It's 15, 20 minutes job at the maximum. But I think the pediatric nephrologist and the anesthetist are the main players in this whole issue. So I will invite Dr. Bagga and Dr. Rashmi after that for their comments. Dr. Bagga, please. Thank you very much. So, uh, you know, over the past few years, uh, 
today connected to 60 and the stars started. Almost 150 children now. And uh, but we already had you know, multiple school from surgery. And uh, our has shown, you know, the outcomes are almost similar to what's supported in the script. Uh, the major issues have been highlighted here because a very large portion does have problems in the bladder. So there are issues, you know, managing a child with a bad bladder was same bladder. And uh, there are lots of issues, you know, lot of risks and all that. In the first child, there were very major issues of uh, sensitization. So that child did have a lot of, you know, he had DRAs, he was showing donor-specific antibodies and so on. So it required multiple sessions of plasma exchanges, Tux lab, IVIG, and uh, some problems by that the interpretation as a result, you know, so it really took us a long time. And managing a child, you know, I must really commend my team, you know, for managing somebody for six years on hemodialysis is quite a lot, you know, from pediatrics. Particularly then, and uh, there are enough you know, surgeons here, and we are not able to establish vascular access. So we have to really manage our kids on uh, catheters, on, uh, which is not the right thing, you know. Because we don't have sisters uh, that are then that we cannot make you know often. So I think we really require a major effort and I could probably uh, request anybody you know to come forward. And because that's a major area where vascular access is a major uh, problem that we uh, that's not the question. How often do you use the gastrostomy and the rehab? Yeah, not too often, you know, normally parents are just correct. And I agree, you know, it should be used much more than that. But parents are resistant. The number two problem is that if you have a gastrostomy, the food that's given is so expensive, the parents are not even good. And the gastrostomy is the only way. And all the work that we're going to be following the gastrostomy. It's expected, even those transplant is expected. So, despite the excellent surgery techniques we had, that is a big issue. When I were talking about vascular access, so it's especially in the first instance where they have an underlying cognitive disorder and it increased the thrombosis. So, if children who have all their major weak thrombosis, so what is the next step? The problem is the time diagnosis and how can you? It is a problem, you know, you can't imagine whenever this child, whenever we used to discuss the first child, you know, we were always protected. So the access problem that happened. And you know, thinking about the hepatic brain trying to protect the candidate, the hepatic brain or trying to do something else. And then last hepatic brain. That's something you know we were considering in this state, but it was always on a victim. That's where access was the question. Thank you. Actually, it's very heartening. I, I'll speak from here and there, so it's very heartening to see the results uh, as good as the Western uh, results. And uh, really, uh, I think the pediatric technology, uh, I must commend uh, their protocols and uh, their, uh, you know, everything they have in place. So, on the other hand, we do, uh, I, I disagree with Dr. Batsal here that we have a very major role to play. We probably come in for 1% of the care. And uh, yes, it's very important, I agree, it's very important, but it's not one of the major uh, things. But one person at the time, it gives a lot of tachycardia to us also. The first time I went into uh, pulmonary edema, we were not supposed to touch the pulmonary air, we could not do the CVP monitoring. And uh, so a lot of uh, things that we are still learning, but yes, uh, a lot of experience is still needed. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments? Sure. Because uh, we are using the uh, answer. What is the long term outcome in the risk of getting uh, cancer? So the long term outcomes are very, very good in these patients. They can be survived for 10, 12 years, 15 years. That we have shown. Yeah. 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 When you are talking about children, you know, clearly our aim is not 5 10 years, but our aim is at least 20 years. So why the team half of the community has increased for 20 years? Our team half is about 20, 15 years, 15 years, 20 years, 20 years, 20 years. For the three half of the PT directly worldwide is in like two years in the, the development. So clearly I agree with you uh, that we are there is an issue but I think I've been picking class that now. Well. I've been picking class. Recently we've been class starting in uh uh given these stands for the concern of steam, you know, and the entire team is here. So they've been class starting in the younger uh, we've been so uh, the younger uh, donors 
So we have done the end block. So we have the Anything else? Basically, we think that whenever we get a pediatric patient and then a skin patient who is emotional, we take care of the emotional development. So, what we do is that not only take care of the physical health of the child, they take care of the physical and emotional health of the child. Because whenever it is a child, Almost all the time, the whole family is involved, especially the mother. So, a lot of credit which we get for an excellent character. I think a great amount of it was. I think our nurses from KTP deserve a special round of applause. They are also here. It's good that they are also participating in this academic discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. If there's nothing else, then thank you so much. <laughs>